the victory day. Thank you, Martha. It's a victory day. It's so good to see you all on this beautiful Wednesday. Put a heart over your head. Just want to make sure that you can hear me. It's a victory day. Again, I am Pastor Shannon Murray, the executive pastor of VGC. Thank you for joining us tonight for Victory Global Fellowship, which is our weekly Bible study here in Zoom. I want to uh, honor our lead pastor, Dr. Jazz, who was on sabbatical this week, and also Apostle Diane. And I also want to give a shout out to everyone who's watching us on Facebook. Just put it in the chat, wave to everyone who is on Facebook. So tonight, I won't be before you long, but I want to talk to you about an interesting subject, a, uh, a unique subject. We're going to talk about silence and quiet and rest. Silence and quiet and rest. So why am I talking about this? I have some selfish reasons, okay? Uh, when I look at my calendar, we're almost halfway through the third quarter of the year, and I'm already wondering where did the time go. If you ask me, summer was a blink of the eye. It's still hot outside in most of the U.S., but the fall season is right around the corner. I always say to my team at work that once you get past Memorial Day, once you get past July 4th, the year just seems to speed up <laughs> before you know it. It'll be Labor Day and then Thanksgiving, and then we're at the end of another year. I hope I'm not stressing anyone out, <laughs> but I just need to put that out there, right? So that's why sometimes we have to get off the grind and recalibrate. Sometimes that involves a vacation, a time away, or even a staycation, but sometimes they may not be an option. I know in June, I celebrated my birthday. I visited St. Croix in the Virgin Islands with a couple of friends. All I wanted to do that whole time was rest. But trust me, just six weeks later, that vacation is long gone. <laughs> I'm already thinking when I can get away next time. But one thing we can always do is rest in our relationship with Christ. Put that in the chat, rest in our relationship with Christ. So I'm coming to you today from the topic, room for silence. Amen? Room for silence. Put that in the chat for me. If you're watching on Facebook, put that in the comments. Our text tonight is 1 Kings 19 verses 7 through 14. Now, before we go to the scripture, I'm going to give you a, big, a bit of a background. Uh, so we have the prophet Elijah, the man of God, who is running for his life from Jezebel, who wanted to kill him. He went about a day's journey, and I do understand, you know, he ran a day's journey on foot. <laughs> there was no Uber, there were no cars. He ran on foot. He was in such a hurry to leave town that, you know, he didn't even grab a donkey, right? So he went about a day's journey and he said, and he literally had this conversation with God. He said, Lord, I'm tired of running. Just kill me now, right? That was literally his prayer to God. So he was physically and mentally exhausted. So he fell asleep. The Lord sent a ministering angel who woke him up and told Elijah to arise and eat. So Elijah ate and he fell asleep again. And we're going to look at the scripture again. We're looking at uh, 1 Kings 19 verse 7. And it says, the angel of God came back, shook him awake again, and said, get up and eat some more. You've got a long journey ahead of you. The scripture says he got up, ate, and drank his fill and set out. He was nourished by that meal. He walked 40 days and nights. Mind you, this is the same man who did a one day's journey and he was about to give up the ghost. <laughs> he told, told the Lord to, to take him away. But after being nourished by the ministering angel, he had the strength and the presence of mind to walk 40 days and nights. He walked all the way to the mountain of God, to Horat. When he got there, 
he crawled into a cave and went to sleep. Then the word of God came to him. So Elijah, what are you doing here? Now we know God sits high and looks low. He knows what's going on. He saw what happened with uh, Ahab and Jezebel and Elijah. He knows exactly what's going on. But he wanted to have Elijah identify the problem. So Elijah says, I've been working my heart out for the God of the angel army, said Elijah. The people of Israel have abandoned your covenant. Now he's, he's calling names, he's squealing. They've destroyed the places of worship. They murdered your prophets. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me. I can just imagine, I can just hear in my spiritual, my mind's eye, that Elijah was tired and he was, he was raggedy and he may have had a tear streaked face uh, and he was complaining to God. God, look, I've done all this for you. You've been, been with me the whole entire way. But here I am, running for my life, the prophet of God. Then he was told by God, go stand on the mountain at attention before God. God will pass by. Amen. So the scripture says, a hurricane wind ripped through the mountains and shattered the rocks before God. But God wasn't to be found in the wind, right? After the wind, an earthquake, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire, but God wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, there was a gentle and quiet whisper. The scripture says, when Elijah heard the quiet voice, he muffled his face with his great cloak, went to the mouth of the cave, and stood there. Now that's significant. This was a man who was about to give it all up, told the Lord to take his life. He had nothing else to give. Here he is doing right by God or so he thought, and his life was in danger. He was running. But this same Elijah, after hearing the gentle and quiet whisper of God, he managed to get himself together, straighten up his cloak. He went to the mouth of the cave and he stood there. Why? Because he heard the voice of God in a gentle and quiet whisper, and he needed to hear what God had to say. So there are a couple of takeaways from this verse. First, when the prophet Elijah went to meet God on the mountain of Horeb, he didn't find God in the loud, destructive wind, or in the earthquake, or in the fire, it wasn't until Elijah heard a gentle whisper that he covered his face and ventured out of the cave to meet the Lord God Almighty. The takeaway is retreating to a quiet place to be refreshed in God's presence equips us to go forward in faith. Amen. Let me say that one more time. Retreating to a quiet place to be refreshed in God's presence equips us to go forward in our faith. And I'll talk to you in a minute why that's significant. The second uh, takeaway is all of these uh, natural phenomenon, hurricanes and earthquakes and fire could at times be indicative of the Lord's presence. But the takeaway is God is not present only in extraordinary things. Now I'm gonna tell him myself, Anytime I hear something outside that's loud and noisy and I can't identify it, I immediately go, is that you, Lord? <laughs> is that you? <laughs> For those who live in the D.C., Maryland, and Virginia area, just a few weeks ago, there was a, a military situation and we had some military jets who had to accelerate um, while they were flying and they literally hit a sonic boom. They brought, they broke the, the, the sound barrier so they can scramble and go fast from, I don't know, for hundreds of miles from the Baltimore area down to Southern Virginia, people heard that one plane make a sonic boom. I was the one, and I know I wasn't the only one because I was on social media who was like, is that you, Lord? <laughs> because I can't identify that sound. It was too loud. It was too miraculous. It was too spectacular. It had to be God. But 
while we're looking for God in loud and noisy and fancy shows of, of, of the miraculous, I hope I want you to know that you can also find him, his presence in a beautiful, sunny day. Amen. We don't do we think of God just when we have a glorious day outside, when the sun is shining and the temperature is right. And do, do we see God? <laughs> you know, but his presence is there also. So back to verses 13 and 14, a quiet voice asks, so Elijah, now tell me, what are you doing here? Elijah repeated what he said. He says, I've been working my heart out for God, the God of the angel armies, because the people of Israel have abandoned your covenant, destroyed your places of worship, and murdered your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. So Elijah's complaint was the same, but instead of being weak and depressed and telling on the people and squealing and being fearful for his life and, 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 and you know, asking the Lord to just take him away because he can't handle this woman Jezebel who's searching for him, he submitted his complaint to God. Amen. Put that in the chat. He submitted his complaint to God. How many of us, and I'm telling them myself, you know, they, you know, we just get filled up with so many complaints that we have to God, but we talk more about the problem than we talk about the person who can solve the problem. Amen. We just get caught up and flustered on what the situation is, but we never submit the situation to God. But Elijah submitted his complaint to God who then gave him instructions on what to do next. The takeaway here is sometimes quiet is the best environment for moving forward, especially in our relationship with God. And I have another scripture for you. So Jesus himself modeled this by retreating to quiet, secluded places to talk with his father. In Luke 5, 16, we read, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Perhaps the key word there is often. So this was Christ's regular practice, and it sets the perfect example for us. If Jesus, who was wrapped both in both humanity and divinity, needed time with God, who's the creator of the universe, what about us? I, it's rough out here. <laughs> put, it, put a heart over your head if you think it's rough out here sometimes. There's a lot of things that we need to go a certain way and it doesn't. The only thing that's keeping us strong, keeping us standing is our faith on God. It's rough out here. But then you have Jesus who was both wrapped in humanity and divinity. He found the answer and the answer was to spend needed time with God. Let me tell you something else about Jesus. I submit to you that as Jesus became more famous, and acquired more attention, both good and bad. There were people who wanted to follow him because they found, you know, Jesus Christ. And we know there were people who wanted to kill him. In fact, Luke 5, 14 to 16 said, after Jesus healed the man, the Bible says Jesus instructed him to only tell the priest and no one else. <laughs> the, but we know how that ended up. The Bible says, but the man couldn't keep it to himself. And the word got out. Soon a large crowd of people had gathered to listen and be healed of their secrets, of their sicknesses. As often as possible, we're learning from Jesus, Jesus withdrew to out of the way places for prayer. He had to get away from the crowd. He had to get away from the loudness. He had to get away from the noise. The more famous Jesus became, his need to maintain close secret communion with the Father. Now, most of us aren't famous, but we are busy. <laughs> but let me tell you what we do, right? Me and you, I'm not just talking about you. I'm talking about myself. Let me tell you what we do. Can I talk about it? Put a heart in your head if I can talk about it. Put a comment in Facebook uh, comments if I can talk about it. The busier we get, the less we talk to God. Come on. Am I telling the truth? I see some hearts. The busier we get, the less we talk to God. Is that true or false? So here's a takeaway from that. The goal of faith, our faith, 
and we we're called to grow in our faith. Faith isn't a one-time occurrence. We can grow it. <laughs> the goal of faith is to bring us into direct personal fellowship with God. That's what we're here for. That's what we were created for. That's our purpose. We all have individual purposes, but once you get into, once you claim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you acknowledge God as the creator of all the universe, it is then our job to grow in our direct personal fellowship with God. How do you do that? You either pray your way into a deeper relationship with God, or you lose heart and ultimately give up on faith right? And not just prayer, to grow in faith. And that's what each of us are called to do. We need to put in the chat, grow our desire to read the Bible. That's one. We need to pray. I mentioned that. We need to meet with other believers. Here we are. We're growing our desire to read the Bible. You showed up on the Wednesday night on a, on, a, a, on a hot summer evening. I'm sure there were other things you could have done. Some of you just walked in the door from work. Some of you have been on Zoom all day and you're doing Zoom for another hour. That's growing your desire to read the Bible. We're also to grow in faith. We ought to, to pray. To grow in faith, we ought to meet with other believers. There's a reason that we have get together at least one um, worship service on Sunday. Even if it's in Zoom, even if it's in person, we're still meeting with other believers. Right now, we're meeting with other believers. So to grow in faith, grow, uh, read the Bible, pray, meet with other believers and serve God. How, what does it mean to serve God? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. We talked about that all last month, amen? So, you know, I get it, I get it, I get it, <laughs> I get it. We are busy people in a busy and very loud world. Everything is competing for our attention. We have news, we have Netflix, any other streaming services, we have social media. When we immerse ourselves in it, it can easily drown out the voice of God. That's the danger, you know, to be so busy, to be so distracted, to be so immersed what's going on around you, that it can easily drown out the voice of God. Elijah could not hear the voice because he was getting distracted by the hurricane and the earthquake and the, and, and the fire. But when he settled his spirit, when he realized that even in crisis, God loves me, even in crisis, he sent me a ministering angel. Even in crisis, he fed me. He provided me a safe place. He gave me supernatural strength to travel for 40 days and 40, night, 40 nights. Even in, in crisis, God loves me enough to take care of me. When he thought about the goodness of God, amen, that's when he grew in faith. That's when his strength got stronger, amen? So we have to find, me and you in 2023, we have to find room for silence. And as I mentioned, that's today's topic, room for silence. We have to find room for solids in our lives so we'll never miss God's gentle whisper. Amen? So there are three spiritual benefits. There are more. I'll focus on three. <laughs> there are three spiritual benefits to a daily quiet time with God. Are y'all ready? I'm going to go through them each at a time. Benefit number one, it draws us closer to him. Amen? it draws us closer to him. If you want to grow your relationship with the Lord, study his word daily. We talked about that. John 15, five says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from God, we can't do nothing. So Spending daily quiet time with God, and not only in crisis, <laughs> spending daily quiet time for God allows us to bear much fruit, and it keeps us from accomplishing nothing. Amen? First point, it draws us closer to God. The second spiritual benefit to a daily quiet time with God is it refreshes our soul. Put it in the chat. 
it refreshes our soul. So spending time with God uniquely refreshes your soul. King David says in Psalms 23, come on, I know you know it right where you are. Just repeat the words right where you are. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yo, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and that was Elijah, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth o- o- over. Surely, goodness and mercy that follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. You, that, just saying that, repeating that old familiar scripture, it refreshes your soul. Amen. That's the benefit of a daily quiet time. I know some of us, we're so used to If I'm spending time with God, then I have to do all the talking. Sometimes that's fine. And some of us are intimidated because we don't know what to say to God. And then some of us feel like, man, every time I get some alone time with God, I'm always begging. I'm always asking for some. And that's okay because he, he, it pleases him to give us our heart's desire. But sometimes let's just whisper scriptures to him, right? Just let him know, like, we know what you said in the word. And it's not just for Elijah. It's not just for Jesus. It's for me in 2023. Sometimes part of our time with God, we should use that time and just whisper sweet nothings to him. Let's recite Psalms 23. Let's show our confidence in what he can and he will continue to do in our lives. Amen? So spending quiet time with him refreshes is our soul. And the third point is it restores our joy. Amen. Peace and quiet help restore joy. Amen. Some of us, it's a, it's a fruit of the spirit. Some of us are looking for happiness. You know, we can't promise you happiness, but God can promise you joy. And you get that joy deep down inside of you that only comes from uh, Jesus Christ is sitting on it high. Nobody can take that away from you, right? So it's much easier to be joyful about the, the things the Lord has given you when you take time to appreciate. I appreciate his generosity. I'm going to tell him myself again. Can I do it? <laughs> I would be in a situation not as bad as Elijah. I would be in a situation, a crisis situation, and I'm literally praying to God. And I'm telling God, Lord, I need a quick work. Before I get into this office, before I have this conversation with this person, before I try to work this thing out that I thought about all night, nothing I could do about it. But before I do this thing, I'm praying for a quick work. You know, (laughs) the Lord will grant my request and I would just go ahead and walk into victory and didn't even look back and thank him. Come on, it's not just me. Put a heart over your head, (laughs) put a heart over your head. If you get so, uh, so thankful for the deliverance, so thankful for the joy, you forget to look back (laughs) and be like, Lord, oh, you did a thing and you didn't have to. (laughs) You did a thing, right? So it is much easier to be joyful about the things the Lord has given you out of his generosity when we show him appreciation. Spending time with God lets you be joyful about the life you have, amen? So there are three spiritual benefits. I've mentioned them, let's put it in the chat. Number one, it draws us closer to him. That's spiritual benefit from daily quiet time with God. Two, it refreshes our soul. And three, it restores our joy. Amen. So, you know, if Elijah, now he was a, a, an amazing man of God who was even uh, swept into heaven. He did not see death. <laughs> he was an amazing man of God. He, you can have, and all of us, let's um, grab in, um, uh, strength from this. We can have moments of failure, but that doesn't mean that we fail. Amen. <laughs> we can have moments of failure. But that does not mean we failed. So all the amazing things that Elijah did, that moment of failure, when that that, that woman, (laughs) Jezebel, sent people after him, and he decided to run in fear, 
that was a moment of failure. But the Lord, oh, he's so kind and he's so gracious. He still saw his soul. He still saw his purpose. He still saw Elijah. And that's how we want God to see us. Amen. We need to know God as deeply and as completely as we're capable of. And having a daily quiet time is one of the best ways for us to do that. So let me ask you this. I've been telling on myself the last <laughs> few minutes, I'm gonna ask y'all a question. Is, a da is daily quiet time part of your daily routine? You don't have to put a heart on your head. You don't have to put it on the chat. It's a thought question. But I want you to think about that. If it isn't, I strongly urge you, Elijah urges you, <laughs> Jesus urges you to consider setting aside time to spend with God every day. Amen. What I love about the Bible is that it's a living, breathing document. We aren't supposed to look at it as if it's something that happened a long time ago. We're not supposed to look at it as if it's a historic, historical artifact. It's telling what happened so we can see ourselves in the scripture. Some of us will see ourselves, something, you know, bad stuff coming down the pipeline. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to run for it, you know, and as we, before we pray, we're going to run, you know, that's what Elijah did, but he stopped, he steadied himself. He saw that God loved him. He saw that he sent him a ministering angel and Elijah found the strength. So in that food that he ate, in that rest that he got, he was able to find the strength to lean on his faith to be like, man, this is not me. This is not what I have to do. The situation hasn't changed. As I mentioned, he had one complaint, said it with a whine, and then he had another complaint, the same complaint, the same situation. But when he turned it over to God, when he shut out all the noise, when he shut out all the loudness, and he was able to focus on the gentle, soft whisper of God, he found the strength, he found the faith to be who God called him to be. Amen. Your daily time with God doesn't have to be for a long time, but even starting your day with five minutes of quiet time can give great benefits to your relationship with God. And we discuss them. It draws us closer to him. It refreshes our soul and it restores our joy. We have the power, spending time with him, we have the power to release life into our day, huh? I, if I let it, I will go to bed stress, stressed out and I will wake up stressed out if I allow it. But nothing is worth my peace, <laughs> amen? Nothing is worth my peace, amen? We have the power to release life into our day. We say here at the Victory Churches as represented here in the DMV in the U.S. and Trinidad and in Toronto, these Victory Churches, we say it's a victory day for a reason. What does that mean? It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what it feels like. We don't even need to look out the window to see what the weather is. We know because we have life in our body, we have breath in our lungs, it's still a victory day. Amen? So that is such an important affirmation because you know, it allows us to command our day, amen? That is a, a, a spiritual discipline that has saved my life many times. I know what my schedule looks like. <laughs> I know what I have to get into that day. I don't wanna do half of it, but I have the ability to command my day with how, prayer, huh? with scripture, and with confessions, affirmations, or declarations. When you command your day, you are setting order. You are setting your day in order. You're not letting your day, your stress, everything that's on your calendar, you're not letting that run you. <laughs> you are asserting authority. And by command, I mean, we can give authoritative, come on, spiritual, come on, and biblical orders over our day and our lives. Amen. It's a spiritual thing for us to say it's a victory day. We're automatically turning the day over to God. Amen. We're standing in our authority as people of God. We're standing on our spiritual foundation. We're standing on what the Bible says, and we are ordering our day and lives. The Bible says, and we know this to be true, that there is power in our words. 
So before you get overwhelmed, before you get too busy, just take a minute to declare over your life and the live, uh, lives of your loved ones a few af affirmations. What, what, what are some of those affirmations? Now, you don't, these are mine. You don't have to use mine. You can if you want. You know, I, I, I told myself, aside, in addition to it's a victory day, I said to myself, my best days are still ahead of me. Amen. I will live and not die. Amen. Sickness and death will pass over my house and not me only, but the homes of my loved ones. Amen. I tell myself my affirmation is, as I give, it shall be given back to me. What does the scripture say? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I just don't say that scripture in church. Amen. That scripture gets me through my life. Amen. So retreating to a quiet place to be refreshed in God's presence equips us to go forward in our faith. Can I say that one more time? Retreating to a quiet place to be refreshed in God's presence equips us to go forward in our faith. We all get weak. We all get tired. We may not, may not be running for our lives like Elijah, but we all may encounter something that we sort of kind of want to, you know, give our power over to the situation. Hmm? We've been there. We might want to give our power over to the circumstance. But for us to grow in our faith, let's read the Bible. No, these are the only tips I, I got. <laughs> you know, these are life-saving tips. I, I wish I could, you know, claim it was me and put them on a t-shirt and, and sell the secret. It's all in the scriptures. We have to read the Bible. We have to pray. We have to meet with other believers as we're doing right now. And we have to serve God. We want God to quiet our heart and our mind. So we are ready to meet with him every day. Amen. Amen. I hope you all receive the blessing from today's teaching. Amen. Over to you, Minister Wade.